On today's Health Watch, more children are being hospitalized for eating disorders. A new study led by Stanford Medicine finds the rates have climbed six to seven fold since 2010. Now, when we think of eating disorders, here's what might come to mind for a lot of people. Being able to control how I look versus I thought, you know, I wasn't like worth enough or smart enough. So I was like, maybe I can be pretty enough or I can, you know, like follow these norms that like social media has set. This is a different generation. Their ability to cope with things is very different. They're all resilient, but I think they're just exposed to a lot more things much earlier than we ever would have thought. And while body image can be a factor in some eating disorders, Stanford researchers say it's not the only factor. They looked at something called atypical anorexia and something called avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, or ARFID. Joining me live now is the author of this study, Dr. Megan Vo, the medical director of the Eating Disorders Outpatient Clinic at Stanford. Thanks so much for joining us, doctor. Thank you for having me. So how are these conditions different from other eating disorders and what are the health risks to all of this? It's a really good question and something that I think is really important to recognize. Um, when we say atypical anorexia nervosa, um, these people have all of the same medical instabilities, all the same psychological effects as people we think of as having typical anorexia nervosa. It's just that when you plot them on a growth curve or you look at them, they look average or even sometimes higher on the growth curve. But it's remarkable that they can have all of the same suffering and instabilities. So what do you attribute to this? Do you attribute social media? I mean, we're talking since 2010, where the uptick really started. And around that time, more and more kids started really using social media. Can we blame social media? Or are there other factors at play here? It's an excellent question. I think it really is multifactorial. Um, there is a clear link between social media use, these messages we get bombarded with about body image and body dissatisfaction um, all the time in a way that our brains really aren't designed to be able to filter. Um, there is a link between that and body image dissatisfaction and disordered eating. But we also know that the trauma of the pandemic really seemed to compound all of these other risk factors and things that were playing a role. So what are signs that parents and caregivers can look out for? Because I know a lot of adolescents are really good at hiding some of the distorted eating patterns. What are some kind of secret signs to kind of look for? Really good question. I think parents have really good pulse on the way that their mm -hmm. children are and the way that they normally are. So if you're sensing any kind of change, like it behooves asking and paying a little bit more attention. Um, certainly secretive eating behavior, like you mentioned, um, is a red flag. So eating alone, eating in secret, changes to their normal eating pattern. Oh, I don't like that. You know, I prefer not to eat that probing into why. And the other really important thing is to know that young people, even in their teens, even in their early 20s, are really supposed to be gaining weight year over year. It's bone mineral density, it's organ growth, it's muscle growth. Um, and so if somebody isn't gaining weight or if they're losing weight, it's important to pay attention to that. So how do you start this conversation though? Because it's a really sensitive topic. If you're worried your child may have an eating disorder, what do you say first? I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, I always say parents know their kids best and so they kind of know what's going to fly and what's not. Um, I would start with I statements. So instead of like you, I'm, you know, you are making me worried or something like that. Like I am noticing this. Let's talk a little bit more about it using open-ended questions um, and creating that space that a young person can share. Um, something that I often come back to is if we were to go out and survey the entire population, about 10% of people would meet criteria for an eating disorder. And probably up to a third of people we talked to would have something that they were suffering from. So I, I might even start with, this is an incredibly common issue and I know it affects people that you might know or might affect you. Can we talk about it? And I know for caregivers, it can be really hard to understand why your child is exhibiting this behavior harmful to themselves. And the parents and caregivers feel angry. They feel sad. They're confused. There's obviously fear for their child's health. So what do you tell caregivers and how to best understand why their child is doing this? 
Oh my gosh, such a good question. Um, I think it's important to recognize that it's not something that the young person could choose or could control, you know, because who would choose this for their lives? So knowing that it really is something that's separate from the from your loved one, from your child, mm-hmm. um, that they can't control and that they need help to be able to defeat, I think is really important. And then I would praise any parent who's even willing to think about it or you know, have that hard conversation that you've already halfway won the battle, that you recognize that this is an issue and that it needs to be addressed. Such important information. All right, Dr. Megan Bowe with Stanford, thanks so much. My pleasure.